We're recording. <laughs> All right. Hi. All right. A screen share. And we're, we're, okay, so we're recording now. Um, all right, so the, like I said, the projects that came out of it was an, an executive education program. We're getting started to work on that. Um, it's a consulting project where we're hopefully going to bring together experts that have knowledge that's humanistic management related, and we're going to offer that to companies along, and we're hoping we can recruit in researchers as well to make sure we create trainings that actually, you know, work and don't get killed once they're introduced into a company. Um, and then also work up a train the trainers program to you know, amplify it and have more people working on that. The doctoral program is a project with Chris Laszlo uh, to kind of revamp a, a doctoral program. There's the op-ed columns in the Manila Time opportunities. And then the, the, um, the, there was another project that's not up there that was the writing of syllabi to include humanistic management content so that people doing courses, uh, the core courses can, you know, have a syllabi with resources, lists of resources that they can use to teach humanistic management at those levels. And then the big thing that we identified out of the S Lab was in order to really amplify our work, we need to figure out how to onboard and communicate um, what we're doing so that we can bring projects in and support them and get them launched successfully uh, because you know we go back up to that first slide it's about planting seeds and helping them grow so um, we want to move from an economist model to a humanistic one and we talked about what those values are um, and you know there you go. So that was uh, any, are there any questions about that initial, the vision of how uh, we see ourselves and want to be? I've got a question regarding the um, donut. Oh, yeah. Very much like the donut economics donut. Is that, has anyone ever questioned that? No, we just created this. I think it was done in like May. <laughs> I guess there's a danger so, if we go public with that, that donut economics might be a bit unhappy about um, that. No, no, I, I actually, I mean, I know Kate okay well. I, uh, um, I think I published a piece in the Manila Times saying that I use that concept and I use it for teaching and my students don't like donuts anymore, so I brought in bagels. So that's why I, that's... Uh, so it's even public and uh, but Kate is okay with that there's no yeah, yeah because I know her well and people working with her I just mm -hmm. yeah, don't want to have any yeah yeah no no maybe it's a good question I need to sort of uh, poke her again I think I sent her that stuff and and I I mean it's bagel management so it's not donut economics it's bagel management. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Bagel management. I know how to justify this now. <laughs> That's the way you get people into meetings, right? Is with food. So. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Questions. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, the history of the organization. Michael, since you're here while we have you, can you kind of give us the genesis of IMA through the earlier work in the AOM and the uh, Humanistic Management Network up to what we're doing and how we fit into the ecosphere. <clears throat> okay, I'm happy to thank you and thank you for organizing this, Jennifer, and, and all of you for making the time. So um, I, I can just share that from my personal perspective, we had and a number of folks that I've, I've met throughout my journey, personally, uh, always, I think, thought that there, there must be something better. And I grew up in Germany, Anke, I think you too, right? So at the time I grew up, uh, we had communism and we had uh, capitalism, whatever, in the, in the same country. And uh, so that was sort of, I feel like going back to, to why I was even interested in this, like, this is very malleable. These systems, they, they seem to be very important. Uh, they decide how we live, they decide whether we have war, etc. And at that time, that was sort of something really, yeah, 
palpable. And so um, that I think has always stayed with a number of us and looking at the system question and how we organize was a critical one. And uh, in the 90s, that was sort of lost, yet I think still important. And, uh, and so that sort of coined my intellectual journey in many ways, more than I basically knew, I think. Um, and most of the folks that we've then sort of started to form the network with came, um, came from this potentially German context, came from that context that there are various systems possible and, and none of them are, uh, are stable necessarily for a long time. And uh, we all were in business. We all worked in business. We all worked, almost all of us in the same consulting company, Accenture. So we're running projects, we were managing these projects, and we thought this is this can't be it. Uh, and we did our doctoral uh, work, basically inspired by this can't be it. There must be more. There must be a better way of looking at this and organizing. And so we were in St. Gallen, Switzerland, which is a <clears throat> which is mostly a, a business-oriented school. Uh, it does have a lot of cachet in the German-speaking world, I don't think anywhere else, but there were some interesting thinkers there and we were uh, basically brought together in some way by, by beer, wine, and, and these conversations. And, uh, and that's what, what happened then afterwards. We were saying we need to do something, we need to organize because this is just, it's not good enough. We can do better and, and how to do it. One of our colleagues, Wolfgang Ammann, had experience with books, etc. And so we decided we want to work on a book. And that was basically the, best, the, day of the first project. And we got a number of, of prominent people at the time, um, it's even then, uh, even still now, like Mohamed Yunus, Amatia Sen, and others to contribute. So that was something where we thought, wow, there is some there there. Many people have this sentiment and they want to contribute, even if they don't know us. So there's a bigger thing <clears throat> occurring. So we wanted to create a platform for that, which was the network. And we had many people interested in that and we didn't really want to build an organization or anything. On the other hand, we also felt that was needed. Um, and then through time, we, we said the network is happening here. We gave it pretty much, anybody can do what they want with, with some of these ideas. Um, and that had massive energy in Australia, in Nepal, in, in, other, in other places, depending on people that were inspired by certain things. And then it also died out when these people were gone. And there was nobody centrally involved in coordinating this. I did some of that. Ernst, uh, another colleague who is sort of taking this on right now a little bit more, um, couldn't. And so this was the challenge to, well, that we witnessed to say we need IMA or another organization that can actually dedicate itself that also doesn't have this loose kind of structure. Uh, and we didn't want to want, we didn't want to lose that loose structure where anybody can affiliate. And we said we need to have a little bit more control and exclusivity and commitment, mainly mainly commitment, uh, to be able to say, okay, we're going to fundraise, we're going to make commitments to other institutions that we work with, and that was the uh, building block for IMA. So in 2000, just historically, 2003, 2004, 2005, that's when the original uh, network idea came up, so humanistic management network. Uh, that's when the terms were created to some degree. And, um, and then it's when we, we started outreach with some other folks. And the book, I think, was then finally published, even though it was done in 2006 and seven. Um, it, it was published 2009, so these lags are massive. But um, since then, we had lots of other books and lots of other projects and lots of other people join. In 2017, we said, this, is, this requires a little bit more structure and organization. So that's, that's the up to IMA. Thank you, Michael. Um, perfect. So there's uh, several organizations, so you know, working in the humanistic management space. IMA is a membership association um, with specific projects, but there's people allied with humanistic management idea all around the world and at universities all around the world, and that's all very good. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, yeah. Um, because I, I wanted you to understand what our projects are that we've got going on. 
there's the Global University Center Consortium for Humanistic Management. Um, and Michael can tell us a little bit more about that because I'm not involved in that, but um, that came out of the 2018 Accelerator, right, Michael? Um, anyways, so it's university centers, business ethics centers working together and collaborating. Um, and you guys get together, what, once a month and there's going to be stuff coming out of that, correct, Michael? Yeah, and Sophia is taking on the role to coordinate the research uh, of these centers and we're at these next months are the ones that we're, yeah, we're, we're ramping that up. Great. Um, there's a humanistic management workshop that also came out of the 2018 accelerator. This is uh, led by Manolo in, in Valencia um, and it involves bringing in a group of um, executives to take them through a, a multi-year project to for education on humanistic management and learning together um, at that level. We have a necessary conversations online discussion um, uh, which is headed by Erica. We have the Humanistic Management Professionals Network, <laughs> um, which is something that Elizabeth and I do where we bring in consultants to talk about the practical application and our market is working professionals, although we do get academics that uh, join us as well. Um, there is the Intellectual Shaman Conversation and then there's the PhD Network. So those are the projects that we have going on now, plus the new ones we added in 2019, um, the, the, the op-eds, the uh, PhD, uh, you know, the doctoral program and so forth. Um, so the other thing I wanted to share was kind of the strategic plan that we had that we came up with um, about three years ago for the USA chapter. Well, that may be what I should talk about first. So IMA is an international association. We have country level associations and then, um, you know, and then special interest groups within, within that. Um, and I'm a member of the USA chapter and the USA chapter, um, about three year, two or three years ago, came up with a strategy document about where we wanted to go as a chapter. And what we decided is that we wanted to act as a hub for academics, uh, practitioners, and policymakers um, to promote humanistic management and leadership consistent with the values of the association. And that we wanted to do that by creating um, basically three different SIGs. One was the researchers and the academics. Another one was the practitioner, the profession, working professionals. And the final one would be policymakers, politicians, people like that. Um, and we wanted everybody to work together, um, but also, you know, professionals have their own needs. PhD students have their own needs. So we understood this to be like these are the basic three constituencies that we need to work with and bring into the organization um, and to help with their own projects, but have them talk together. So policymakers, you know, in Washington might need access to researchers to testify on whatever policy is. Um, you know, so academics should be informing the policymakers. Uh, Professionals should be informing the policymakers. Policymakers should be interacting with all of that. So that was our idea: was to create these three SIGs, um, and also to create a com online community where people could meet each other, so that we don't silo information and you don't have to come into one part and talk to one person to get in and then get introduced to people but that we democratize the information and the access to who all is involved so that people can find each other. I'm in Florida, for instance, and you know, about eight or nine of the business schools here have 20 or 30 people on our mailing list. And none of them know, right, that there's other professors in their college <laughs> that feel like them. Um, and so there's an opportunity to help people find each other. 
Um, and to do that, we do have to democratize the information to a certain extent. And there is a project that we're working on to get that done, to create that website that allows people to find each other. Um, but so you know, we have a list, a mailing list of about a little over 2,000 people that have actively signed up to get our information. And we do have the ability to search through that list to find people at certain universities. So resource if you, if you want it and need it. Um, there's another list that's like 6,000 people, but it's not really our list, so we're not supposed to use it, but um, Michael can tell us more about that when he's, if he wants to, but those are the resources. Well, it's, um, it's our list, but it's sort of something that's, that's less, it should it's be used It's a little less. bit older and, right. Um, as for groups that are aligned with us, um, at one point when I was new, <laughs> I was trying to get my head around, every time we had a conversation, people would throw out the names of organizations and the names of academics, and I was, my head would swim. So one of the things I put in that folder was a list of, I'm going to put this in air quotes, aligned <laughs> organizations. Um, there's no official affiliation between us and them. These are people who are working on things that we consider to be humanistic management um, that, or that we know people who work in those things and we know them to be humanistic management. But right now there's no real official way for us to create those official connections. So it's mostly just a list of organizations that are working in the same space as us. Uh, you know, we've had the uh, Rob Breiner for Center for Evidence-Based Management on our Lunch and Learn. Um, and so there's just a whole bunch of, and I think, um, Michael, I remember you talking about um, the guy from Evo, Evonomics or um, there's another humanistic group. Um, so these are organizations and associations that have similar missions but they're not stated explicitly as, as humanistic, but they're totally humanistic, if that makes sense. Um, and there are some more formal associations, I think with the Global Contact, Compact, the Global Dignity uh, Network, um, the Wellbeing Economic Alliance, um, and, and things like that. So there are, um, we do have ways into this. So if there's projects you want to do that are allied with this, you know, not a problem, right? Um, so we've done the strategic plan. Hold on. And let's see. Projects, strategic plan, onboarding. All right. So do you guys have any questions? I just want to make sure I've gone through the stuff that kind of historical basis before we move on to project origination and how that all works. Any questions so far? I have a quick comment and question. So comment would be, I wouldn't too quickly break the um, people can affiliate this with this sort of orthogonally to their existing uh, departmental and other scholarly connections. I think that actually helps make it a little bit stickier. It's, it's nice to just try it and be like, oh, who's here? What, this is different. This is kind of um, separate to start with. So although it's great when you find someone who, who knows about it, it, I don't know. But my question would be, um, we, we've talked about all these things, but not all of them are as big. So um, maybe more on the programs. Um, tab that you had up before, you know, where is there kind of lots of energy? Um, where, the, where do we think the energy is going to be next? Research center sounds like one of those. That's kind of a question I have. Okay. Hold on. We're going to share again and bring up the projects tab. Um, right now, there's a lot of energy around uh, the Global University Center Consortium. I think a lot of good stuff is going to come out of that. Um, and so to me, that's where most of the energy is. But we have different people working on different projects, right? So it's really up to the people working on the project, what happens with it. I know Michael's put a lot of 
energy into the center consortium. So maybe Michael, you can kind of tell us where that is and what the group is hoping to accomplish with it. So yes, um, the the center consortium, right? Sorry, yes. I was distracted because my kids are walking around here and, and are fascinated by looking at you. <laughs> um, so the center consortium was, a, an, again, an idea that came out of a physical meeting that we had, as Jennifer, you were saying, and most of them, uh, most of the participants in the meeting were actually also affiliated with centers, not all of them. And so we felt like maybe there is a good uh, mid-level playing field, meso-level playing field um, for people that are affiliated with centers that are potentially part of the universities, but also beyond. So because I think we're not organizationally able to work with universities at the university level and other institutions do that, we felt that centers were something that we could possibly add value to. And um, <clears throat> since, since we started the conversation, we had at least interest, extreme, uh, high interest expressed by at least 12 centers across the globe. What's up? Okay. Sorry, this is morning parent signing time. Okay. Um, so that <clears throat> at least the center interest is very high in terms of collaboration on research, teaching, pedagogy development, and uh, outreach. So these three buckets. And uh, we are happy to have moved towards a state where we now, uh, and this, these centers also pledge to pay money fundraise money or, or support this. And we're, we're gonna see how this is working. But that was one of the, the problems that we always faced is that there's a lot of energy and then it's very difficult to structure anything without many resources. So that was an explicit part of the memorandum of understanding. I think we have 12 university centers across the globe, including China, including Germany, including uh, Philippines, the, Mexico, Spain, and a bunch of uh, American centers sign that. And, and I think it will be fewer than those that signed that will actually come up with uh, the monies. And we'll, that will help us enough to coordinate at least the research piece. Sophia will help with that. And uh, we were working on an outreach coordinator and a teaching pedagogy development coordinator. If you know people that might be interested in that and want to do that, um, we would be excited to think about that. Uh, we have lots of opportunities there um, and uh, we need more organization. So that's the, that's the, the current challenge and opportunity. Sophia, yeah. do you wanna to add to that on what exactly the research project is? Hi, sure. <laughs> um, so there isn't necessarily one project, but what we're, what we're gonna do, what we're doing is, We'll be coordinating uh, relevant research across different centers. So, if say one center has um, something that they're really passionate about, and they and they have certain uh, resources for or uh, data for, they're, they're interested. And then another center maybe could link up with them um, if they have a need that aligns with the the resources of the other centers. So, we're kind of doing coordination that way. Um, there there probably are some projects underway, but right now the conversations. That, that I've been having with the centers um, kind of one by one is what, what is your you know, main goal for this year? Do you have any projects currently underway? What would success look like at the end of 12 months? And the conversation that's most relevant, it seems to be at the moment is um, what, what, are you, what, what could you receive from the center that you're not receiving already from your university or from your current research? And how can, we, how can you best sell this um, center membership to your university. And so that's the stage that, that I'm at right now in those conversations. Um, probably, uh, I, I don't, this is just a guess, but I would imagine probably one month from today at our next PhD fellows call, we probably will have more, um, more insight on specific projects and how the different centers are gonna be able to work together and collaborate around those projects. Another thing that's interesting about the centers is that, um, it's not necessarily going to be just centers collaborating with centers. 
there has been um, there. I've I've had some interest voiced about centers being able to collaborate with research fellows, EMA research fellows, and PhD students at various institutions. So there will be collaboration across multiple different um, angles and, and, and ways uh, that we can kind of do this work. So I'll update, I'll update a month from now. And um, I can just share, I both Sophia and I were, were trying to connect with some of the other institutions that want to have research done, especially on the research and, and the economy for the common good. Anke, you, you know them better. Uh, they have started with a, an academic piece. Uh, so, uh, Günther Koch is his name. He is coordinating that work. So if you come across him, it, he, 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 they are partners of us now more formally. What we need to do and what we need to figure out is how do we want the, that partnership to, to what, what, what should it look like? There are definitely research opportunities. There are certain pieces that maybe can be done almost as a consulting kind of work. Uh, with their balance sheet and, and assessing it and, and things like that. I think one of the issues that we're running up pretty quickly will be qualified manpower <laughs> or people that, that are willing to do that kind of work. So if you have ideas about that, that'd be great. We're, we have the possibility to work with Conscious Capitalism and B Corps and all of those groups. I'm not sure that we're ready to, to do that. Yesterday I was... Um, even asked with, with other, other high level groups to, how we can work together. Of course, the center consortium is a much better way to do that than on an individual basis. And yet, just for you as fellows, I'm hoping always that you guys also uh, can benefit from that or want to be part of that kind of work. We just need to figure out what that would look like. Um, and uh, just, Yesterday, I was meeting again with David Sloan Wilson. I don't know if you know of him, um, but he's a famous evolutionary biologist. <clears throat> and he has a, an institute called the Evolution Institute, and they're working through the evolutionary lens with businesses right now. And so Jonathan Haidt maybe is more familiar with uh, for some of you, but he, he and him, they're working together. So they had the session yesterday that I was um, invited to. And... Uh, Apologize for my kids. They feel that's the very stage. entertaining. It's yeah, good. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're not just they're just not eating. So <laughs> I have a question. So, uh, Lucas, please. So, um, so there are probably going to be a lot of ways that other institutions might want to connect, and that's the question for us also and for you. What, what would look, what would, which institutions would you like to work with? Do you need data for uh, from some specific angle? What, uh, what kind of engagement would, would you want to do? The day before, I was uh, just asked by a multi-billion-dollar company in in Latin America to say, well, we want to work something, we want to write a case. Um, and our road is not here. We've done that with another group here in, in, in uh, New York. And it's just like, I don't have the bandwidth to do this kind of stuff. And uh, we're not in Central America. So if we find smart ways to connect with people in these places, and if you have those connections, and if anyone here has any of that, that interest and bandwidth or knows of others, I think this is, this is quickly becoming a, a possibility. And um, we're, we're having to turn down a number of those for now. Right, and that's kind of the challenge that we're hoping to address by creating um, a community network, an online system where people can find each other because we do have a need. We have companies, we have, you know, academics, but how do we get them to pair, how do we get the right people to pair up um, together? And right now the information is siloed, right? It's in Michael's head or it's in David's head or it's in Manolo's head. And, um, you know, how do we get that distributed so that we do find the right people to help out with these projects? And we're going to have the same issue within the consultancy project. Uh, you know, we have experts, we got to find companies and we have to find the researchers that are interested in a particular question as well to help them work together. Um, Celeste, you said you wanted some more specific information on the economy for the common good. Um, Mike, I don't know if we have that yet, Michael, or? Well, I think, uh, I, I understand, Celeste, the, the point, we talking with uh, individuals, 
that's just a very time intensive and because those institutions for example economy for common good i think has 2000 businesses currently it's going to be hard to identify these these um projects so we need to find a process which we're if you have ideas how to do this how to create that kind of connection right i think the economy for the common good has a list of organizations on the website that you could reach out to as an right. individual um, and then I think the other umbrella that we can use is the UN Prime for Humanistic Management. Um, so uh, management education projects uh, can be kind of branded as a UN Prime Humanistic Management Project mm -hmm. as well. Can, um, I, can I just jump uh, in there in terms of economy for the... Com Sorry, Jürgen, did you want to say something? No, after you, after you. Let's just finish on this topic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the so I'm very much involved in the economy for the common good, <clears throat> and um, they do run consultant training courses, which are four days long. Long. So I'm a trained economy for the common good consultant who get people like me if they wanted to get then channeled to do consultancy work for interested companies. So I think that's important to know. So there's a, there's a an expectation that people who work with the ECG matrix are actually ECG trained as an accreditation system. So if anyone is interested in that, I'm happy to put you in touch. There's regular courses running in wherever people are interested. So, um, and they're usually on a gift economy basis. So you don't need to be super rich to do these courses. Um, and if anyone's interested, I can and I can host a session or half an hour on what is ECG, who are they, what they do. I mean, it's as complex as I'm a, <laughs> but um, I would do my best to explain who they are and what I know about them. But I think collaboration, yes, definitely. But I think it needs to be thought through that we're not like that, that we know what they're expecting as well. Perfect. And I would like to learn more about that. Anka, so maybe we could schedule that for another yeah. conversation. Yeah, I'm happy to do. You're and I think what they what they are we can learn a lot from them in terms of if we wanted to do consulting and outreach. They're they're excellent in, in some pieces. What they want to know from us is the research piece. So that's also for you fellows that are interested in that research uh, domain. That's that's the critical piece where we can add value to them. Okay. Jurgen. Yes. Um, um yeah maybe it's a bit of an out of the box question and hopefully it's not breaking the scope and the focus of of our call but uh tyson's question and in fact also michael's story uh triggered um triggered a big question in me um when we said where is the energy where's the urgency um cl the climate crisis and the global protests uh, just last Friday, right, 20th September, seemed to be a historical movement. Um, I mean, there's major urgency um, and there won't be need for humanistic management on, on a dead planet, if I express it very simply. Um, so I'm wondering if we, I mean, I know we're indirectly addressing it, right? Humanistic management is also about sustainability, but I'm wondering if it wouldn't be an opportunity to be more explicit on, um, on the point that well-being includes well-being of people, but also well-being of planet. Um, I mean, it's probably no coincidence that I'm sitting here in Bhutan, who with Gross National Happiness has this beautiful well-being paradigm and is at the same time the only carbon neutral or even carbon negative country in the world. And the reason is that their paradigm includes that humans are part of nature. Um, so I'm wondering if we wouldn't be able to, to find resonance with this new young global movement, all the Greta Thunbergs around the world, um, if we would find a way to link up with that energy and that uh, that interest over um no i think you know yes the answer is yes to me humanism is the awareness that we are animals on a planet in an ecosystem 
and we only thrive when our ecosystem thrives, which means I don't know that you can be a humanist if you're not also an environmentalist, right? Um, but I do think that that's part of changing how business thinks about what they're doing to include not just economic stakeholders, but the environment and the, the world as well as a stakeholder, right? Um, and that's kind of the challenge is how do we expand what is considered as a valid concern in any decision that a business makes? Like that's the bigger challenge, right? <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, maybe, I mean, I'm wondering, it's good to hear that obviously we do think about it. Um, and I just want to pose it as a suggestion. I'm not pressing for it, but um, to potentially be more explicit or to have a more targeted thematic initiative might, uh, might be fruitful if people want to drive it. I mean, um, the Global Compact, for instance, also started super broad, right, covering everything. Um, and one of their more successful initiatives is around climate action. Um, I mean, I just wanted to, to, to express it um, because also when I saw, when I went through your presentation, Michael, um, which you shared after last call, I mean, it's, it's, it's very refreshing to see um, the focus on mindset and paradigm shift. Um, and that's really, that's definitely the area where I'm super interested with my research. At the same time, um, I mean, this external urgency, I'm wondering, sometimes it might be good to be explicit about it. Sure. Just a suggestion. Let me kind of use that to transition to, um, and I'm going to share again, uh, the how projects, how we kind of create projects and get them going. Um, humanistic, IMA is a self-managed collective <laughs> intentionally. Um, so we are trying to organize ourselves on egalitarian democratic principles and make decisions by consensus. But the problem is how do you onboard new projects, um, you know, and get them launched. And it's often very disorienting to people who come into the association who have a project in mind, let's take Jurgens and environmentalism, how do we, you know, put that front and center into humanistic management conversations. Um, well, okay, great, but there's no hierarchy within IMA. So where does decision-making, who gets to decide that this is a project we're gonna work on? And what we came up with kind of came out of the S Lab, which is that uh, ideas are gonna be brought in, they'll be discussed, people recruited in um, the, you know, the project is proposed to the group and people go, yes, we want to do that. Co-collaborators are found, identified and found and recruited into the project. And then they become autonomous and work while still collaborating with IMA. Did that make sense? So an idea is pro pro proposed, collaborators found and recruited, launch of project and then uh, communication and coordination with other aspects as might might work out for the project. So that's how we're hoping to onboard projects. Um, so if there's a project like the environmental thing, yes, I think no one's going to say no to that, right? So the question is, what should that project be? How can it have the most impact? Who do we need to recruit in to help with that? And um, how should the other, you know, projects interact with that, right? So for instance, I'm on the Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. I would love to have a guest talk about how professionals can integrate climate science and climate as a decision-making factor into their everyday decision-making. That would be fabulous. And I'm sure there's things that um, the consortium can do in research projects and, and all of that. So any questions about pro how we onboard projects? Because that's really where we're going to end up with y'all is you all have ideas and projects you want to pursue. So how do we help you do that? And this is the process we came up with. Questions, ideas. Very feedback. useful. Thank you. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. um, just real quickly on specific projects needs we have, we do need it to create a social membership site creation um, so that we can find those co-collaborators. <laughs> Because if we have a small group of people, as Michael said, the bandwidth isn't there for the, those individuals, we do have to expand out and reach into the, the association network that we have to find those co-collaborators, whether they're businesses or PhD students or whoever they are. Um, and so that's what we're hoping the membership site can do. But the resource we do have right now is we do have a 2000 person plus mailing list. And we can say, hey, we have a new project. Is anybody interested in working on this? Please contact us and get back to this. The same thing can happen regionally. Um, you know, we can go in and ask. We can research people at certain universities and, and get you those names. So we can help find those co-collaborators for you if you want to do a regional project versus an international project. Um, and then, the, the final project that we have up here is kind of old, but we still have it. Um, we do need to do better at our content creation and dissemination <laughs> and social media dissemination. So we need people to focus on that as well. Um, we've been going for about 15 minutes now. Um, what I'd like for the next time we meet is to have a conversation about your specific projects that you'd like to see happen within IMA um, so we can have that conversation about what is it that you want to get what you know what are the projects that you'd like to be working on so that we can start that process of finding co-collaborators for you um, and and see if we can launch those projects more fully but in the short term do you guys have any more questions about how the organization is structured and worked at this point in time Jennifer, can I maybe just clarify for, sure. for there is some level of, of authority there. Um, yeah. So for the EMA structure, maybe uh, for the for the EMA fellow structure, maybe not as much. And we're exploring this. And I think there would be some value in, in like reflecting on this experience and how to then learn from that. Um, there is a group in the United States. There are groups in Spain, in, in Mexico, in um, other places that also do have a board. And so there is a formal board that does make the decisions. And uh, we're having that the same way on the international level. So there is this structure that does officially, let's say we were applying for grants and other things like that, I think uh, needs to be involved. So I just wanted to make sure that that is clear. It's not completely, and that's also part of the network uh, lesson it's not completely decentralized and anybody can do anything. Actually, we want to have a little bit of a guidance and structure without, without making it cumbersome. And, and Jürgen, I, I to completely agree. Maybe we need to be more specific in our outreach that these SDGs or that the, the, the uh, environmental dimension is critically connected to this. This is the whole reason we're doing this because we're basically facing extinction. So it's not actually that we save, to, save the planet, but save us. And uh, that's how we need to organize better. And um, so if there are specific ideas and projects, I think as Jennifer was saying, I think it'd be great to collect it if you could send it in some way, shape or form, or that now that you know a little bit more about the ecosystem that, that we have, and maybe if you have ideal partners, if you want to do something. See, I, was, I was moving myself and of course uh, my kids find me. Of course um, they do, <laughs> kids are kids, they always find you. <laughs> So uh, if you if you have like a specific wish for a research partner and you were selected as as research fellows right so so we're thinking that you will sort of be working more in that research domain so you know about the centers the center consortium you know about some of the emerging partnerships for data data generation or or work with um, institutions on in the field and um, then maybe we can also find actively find that for you. Right, because it's not just right. who's associated with us, the, the humanistic management uh, world is larger than us. So the humanistic management network also has people that they work with and we can reach out to them and say, hey, do you know anybody as well um, to help find those co-collaborators? So um, other questions about 
the organization, how we came to be, where we are, and how things work, and how to interact with us. Um, quickly, who else is, um, I guess, is the board just that you already showed us on the website that those are the folks we, we know many of them like Erica, David, you, you all. Um, but some I don't think we have talked about very much like All right, hold on, let me Manuela, share. Kind of... Benito. Right, there's, um, so there's the International Association and then there's National Associations. So um, I don't even know if this list is quite up to date, but you know, these are the people that are involved, I think at the international level, Michael. Um, and then there's also the national association. So there's people in Italy working collaboratively on similar projects there and they've you know, done some projects um, that they interact with, but like I'm on the USA chapter board. Mm -hmm. So pretty much everything I do is just on USA chapter activities because I'm not on the international board and I'm not on the center consortium board. So each of the projects has their own kind of authority network. And then like the USA chapter can authorize things within the USA, but we don't have the ability to tell the Italy chapter what to do, but you know, it, they, they're open as much as anybody else is to collaboration. So that's the whole point of being in an association is to collaborate with people. So, um, you know, it depends on what you want to do and where you want to do it and who you're looking for, for from help. So. Cool. Other questions? And if you are in a, in a country that's not represented here, and th there are probably potentially network groups as well, because the network has sort of also this kind of diverse set of, of chapters. I know, Anke, you're in England. I know that there are some people working in England on that. That would have been my question now. Why are they not here? So what, what, is, what makes people that, feel on this base or not? So the, 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 as I said, originally the network was started and it basically very loosely affiliate people could just start something. And that happened, I think, in England only about a year or uh, two years ago when we started the association. And um, I think there there were differences in, in how Ernst and I were seeing this to, to work, to move forward. And it's, at that time, we had a lot more movement on, on the Somehow it did some parallel efforts um, that we need to potentially revisit. On the other hand, I think it's w what the associations do, they, they are focused on much more commitment. Um, so that's why we have fewer people. We have fewer people. That doesn't mean that in England there couldn't be an association if they wanted to. And what has been problematic, for example, if people say they want to get a grant, they cannot say that they're part of the organization or the network. The network is not as powerful as an, organ as an association that does have members that pay, that do things, that have a real program, a real commitment, a real partnership. Whereas with the network, it's always difficult to say we are working with somebody because we didn't know who was working with them. Sure. Yeah. So, for example, in the UK, for the UK people, Tyson, have you been in touch with the UK? Network yeah. people? Uh, not a lot, but yeah, I'm on their mailing list. Um, I've emailed with Christina once or twice. Um, it's it's they're fairly slow moving. I mean, I, are you also in touch with them, Anka? No, but I just thought maybe we can coordinate. Yeah, I will. I'll send you. Um, you know, basically what I know about them. It's um, they they do an event every once in a while and uh, and they are interested in more energy so they're, they're, maybe, they're fine maybe it can align somehow with us without again without duplicating efforts maybe right. yeah. yeah well and so that that was the idea that there is maybe like a, like the economy for the common good does there's an energy field here and then sort of something emerges out of that and so the network is oftentimes potentially a good start for some people that say they want to organize more and yeah, you don't that wanna... was, I know ECG reached out 
to them and it was fruitless like it, it kind of disappeared somewhere and so well, that, that's been our experience almost always with the network kind of structure that's why we said you know what this is this is too bad and it does reflect poorly on the concept the name and, and the people that yeah, are involved shame, in market, yeah. Right? yeah let's see what we can do here in the UK you know the way I look at it like when I went to India we got the names of people that are associated with humanistic management in India and I was able to meet up with a couple of people um, but they're associated with the network but as individuals it's that those distinctions are irrelevant right they're interested in the point is that they have expressed an interest in humanistic management and so that makes them natural allies to us um, and so it, it, you know I don't really care what group people feel affinity with or whatever as long as the work gets done and these people are allies to us just as you know other people in the economy for common good or working on SDGs would be things like that. They're allies to us. They're potential collaborators to us. Um, and that's how I think about it. So, and again, we can get UK names for you all out of the mailing list. So, <laughs> you know, I think the mailing, our mailing list is at the moment US heavy because um, the, pro the way we've gotten the names on that list have been the intellectual shamans, necessary conversations, and the professionals network. Um, and so it's possible that, you know, in England, you can create a monthly call about humanistic management topics and what, who knows what comes out of that, but it invites people in to start participating and having these conversations on a regular basis. And out of those conversations come projects. Right, and the commitment to do the project. And also a central point, it's also always really important that there's a central point of contact who has the ability to bring it to the larger group. Bye, Michael. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's- Thank you all, thank you all. Thank you, Jennifer, thank you. for hosting us. So I'm I think that's try. how it's gonna grow. Like right now, I've got a critical mass of people in Florida that we're gonna start having conversations about Florida specific projects. And that'll make it easier for us to, you know, work with the, the B Corps people in Florida and the local networks and see what comes out of that, right? So I just look at it, these are allies, they're potential collaborators, there you go. Yeah. Do we have any other questions before we done or are we done? <laughs> I would just say be carefully with um, the Europeans in how you mine your, your email list. Yeah. That would be, the way you described it just now would be running close to uh, maybe outside of GDPR okay. requirements. So in the, U in the US, I think you're, Home free. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I, what I'm saying is we can go in <laughs> who signed up for the mailing list that has like a miami.edu email. Yeah. Right. And then what you do with that list, all these people are on the Miami website, right? Right. Uh, you can find them online and, and contact them as individuals and not necessarily say, hey, I got your name from here. I mean, it would be, yeah, you're right. Issues. But um, in the UK, they can actually ask you where you got your name, and then you have to tell them. Okay. And then if they don't approve, they have recourse. Okay. Right? Anywhere, anywhere in Europe, uh, that's the law of the land now. And it's, yeah, I would not. It's a real it. pain in the butt. Yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> ask mail anybody, um, you know, at all off this list. Um, but we, what we can do is because people have proactively signed up for our list and double opted in, we can segment an email through our system to go to them mm. and say, hey, there's an, an event in England, right? Yeah. And Would that's be okay because they've signed up for us. So we Got do it. have the ability to segment an email out to those segments through our that's mailing great. list for people who have proactively signed up. Cool. So, um, okay, so what I'd like to do with your permission is in a month, let's meet again. And let's have a conversation about your research interests and the projects you'd like to see happen um, so that we can have a conversation about how we support you with that. Are there any other topics that you want to discuss through the onboarding process? This has been great. Okay, good. 
Just one quick question. I think, Jürgen, you're still not on the WhatsApp group, right? I couldn't add you. Uh, I am. Uh, I even yeah. responded. Uh, yes, I'm there with my German number, uh, plus four nine. Okay. Okay, so if everybody's there and everybody Thanks. happy, I wouldn't sure. Okay, cool. So I'm going cool. to end tonight from the St. Paul's Institute, which is uh, called, like, what city do we want to live in? Something about dignity. Um, so I hope it's going to be interesting and hope I can report back some insights from that. Um, also a possible collaborator. So I, I, I'm going to use WhatsApp then to feedback. Perfect. Great. Yeah. Cool. Um, and just to remind you, if there's videos, things, content that is humanistic related, it doesn't have to originate with us. We can amplify it. You know, it's about amplification of people's work, not like owning the work. Right. Yeah. So. Cool. All right, so next month, same time, same bat channel. All right, thanks everyone. Thanks so much, all the best.